now that we're slightly warmer and we're feeling a little happier, maybe we can turn to the book of Acts chapter 2 and we're going to read from verses 42 to 47. I want to continue um, in a sense from last week's message, but I want to speak to us this morning about the necessity of community, and I must probably shared this somewhere along the line in church, but the necessity of you and I being in the body of Christ, of the fellowship and the relationship that we have one to the other because of our relationship with the Lord. You see, when we come to know the Lord Jesus, what the Lord does for us is he wants to restore our relationship with God. One that was fractured in the garden. One that was broken. And I'll get to that a little bit just now, but I just want to introduce. In the sense of that whatever we do in the body of Christ should always be to build meaningful relationships one with the other. But starting with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because without that relationship, our relationships are meaningless in the sense of a godly relationship, of an eternal relationship. And you know, God's intention for every single one of us, for every believer, everyone who comes to Christ, is to have a meaningful relationship with those who we fellowship, and those who we come into contact with. Otherwise, basically, we could just call ourselves another club, a social activity. An activity where we come on a Sunday, we meet and we go home, and we carry on with life. But never was it intended that church is a social club. Church is a fellowship. Church is communion, one with the other. Let's look, let's look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And it reads as follows. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And I want to just, I want to stop there and just highlight something. It's not part of, it's not part of the message, but it's just something that I was driving here this morning that the thought came into my mind is, do you know that the awe of God entered into the believers before anything else began to happen in their lives. Because that's what it reads. It says, and the awe of God. What? Why? Because they devoted themselves to what? To the word. They devoted themselves to prayer. And when they had devoted themselves to these things, what happened? A sense of an understanding of who God is in their lives. And it says that all came upon the believers. And then signs and wonders took place. You understand the, the sense and the order of how God works. His manifestations do not precede worship. That's what I said to you last week. Is that God's intention to bring Israel out of Egypt was his people would worship him. That's what he said every single time through Moses to Pharaoh. Let my people go, that they would worship me. So it says, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And I said this last week, I spoke about Ananias, and uh, I spoke about um, how the presence of God was with them. And their commonality, or what they had in common, caused them to behave in a certain way. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, and as, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. And if the work of the Holy Spirit is to turn the hearts to the message, to turn people's hearts to the message and the person of Jesus Christ, 
And I want to just break in there and, and just say, um, especially if we understand what happened on the day of Pentecost, because that was the power of the Spirit, not the actions of the apostles. The apostles were just the means by which God brought the message. And the Spirit worked through them. But we also have to remember, as I've said before, is that the apostles obeyed. And so, if the work of the Holy Spirit, therefore, is to turn the hearts of people to the message and the person of Jesus Christ, would you think that God is looking for employees or is he looking for people who love him? Because for many of us, we behave in a way that we are employees of God. And that we don't, we're not lovers of God. We're on a nine to five schedule. We're on a schedule that we have certain times allocated to God and the rest of the time is my free time. You see, that's the behavior of an employee. When you love someone, there is no free time. When you truly love someone, and when I say love someone, I, I look at, and I, I've mentioned this, and I want us to understand this concept of biblical relationship. I want us to understand this concept, this idea of what God is presenting and what God is saying. Because God, every letter of the Bible is God's heart exposed to you and I. You see, God wrote it in word that we might understand his heart for people. And when God writes something, it's not, it's not just writing, as I said before, to full pages. But it's that we might have an intimate and holy understanding and a fear and reverence for a living God who wants a relationship with his people. He doesn't want employees. He's not looking for people who will act in accordance with his will at times, but at other times live according to their will. He's looking for people who will love him unconditionally as he loves us and as he, as he displays it through his word to us. Paul writes in Ephesians 3 that, that he wants the Ephesians to understand the depth and the height and the width and the breadth of the love of God. You understand what that means? It means that it doesn't matter where you go, God's love is there. It doesn't matter who you are, God loves you. He won't condone your actions, but he loves you. It means that, that when I'm at my lowest, it doesn't matter where I am, God's love is there. There are those who, uh, I read a commentary, they say the cross points to the love of God, that the direction of the cross points downward to the depths of the earth, to the depths of, of sin, and God loves you. To the heights of heaven, and God loves you. And to the width and the breadth and, the, and as wide as you can, point to the east and the west. God's love is there. And this is what we need to learn to understand, is that God expects love in return. But God wants us to love in community and with the support of the community around us. Because we cannot love on our own. We need each other for support. And, and the book of Acts displays this. And I want to say to you, you know, I've said this to you and I've said many things many times and I speak and I tell you things. Why? Because they're important. Jesus had many followers. But he had few who loved him. We read of the thousands that followed him. And yet we only find 120 that truly loved him enough to obey his commands. It's amazing, isn't it? How Jesus touched the lives of Thousands, tens of thousands, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of people during his short period upon earth. That his love was spread in the news of his gospel and his miracles. And people flocked to him, whichever town, and followed from town to town. They followed Jesus. But very few loved him for who he was. 
and it's what we have today, that many will follow him, but not many love him. And it takes someone who deeply loves another person to speak and act on their behalf without a willing audience. And why do I say that? It's because when the apostles, when the disciples, when the 120 who waited in the upper room and the Spirit of God fell upon them, when they went out into the community, they never went to a people waiting and expecting to receive news of the Messiah. You see, the people in the streets who were there, they were to celebrate a religious activity, a religious festival. They were not there for a Jesus convention. They had no idea or hope that the Messiah had been among them, and now he had passed on that message to those who loved him and who were faithful. And we have to understand that when we are, we are given and we are the conduit of what God, or we are this pipeline or this channel that God uses to present his message of love, his message of fellowship, his message of communion with people, when, when, when we understand that that's what it, it doesn't matter the opposition that's in our way. It doesn't ma matter who stands before us. It doesn't matter what people might think of us. Because I love him so deeply that I will share the intimacies of knowing him, even if people think I'm mad. You see, and that's what the disciples were confronted with. They were confronted with people who had no idea. In fact, if you remember and, and you read a little bit beyond, before this, you find that what's said is that these people are mad. And then others said, no, listen, they speak in our native tongue. They're not babbling. They're speaking and they're presenting a message. Hear the message that God is speaking to us. And I wonder, I wonder if, if one person had remained in the upper room, one single person, had remained in that upper room and the Spirit of God had fallen upon and, and one person had gone out into that uh, thing and one person had spoken a message, what would have the impact been on the lives of people? You see, through the Spirit, God still has an impact. But you see, God chose a people that would be a community together to support one another. And how often it is, it is it as a single person, we, we've taken the message of God and we've spoken to people and people look at us and think we are mad. Well, well you're a single individual. You have no support. You have no community. There's no one with you. And I wonder when our evangelism team go out and, and there's a few of them and one and two and three and sometimes there's four or five. But when they go out and there's just a couple and, and they're in amongst the crowds of people at the taxi rank and that, those people in the taxi rank, Look upon them the same as they may have looked upon the apostles had there just been one or two. Who are you to come and speak to us? But when we're a community of believers sharing the message and people are seeing the life of God in us, surely the impact, surely the message comes across, hey, these people are truly believers and lovers of God. And so often, our sense of a relationship remains broken. Why? Because there's no support structure in the body of Christ, one for the other. You see, it comes back to religious activity. It comes back to religion. And so often, we come to church not to celebrate the person, we come here on a Sunday to enjoy what we can receive from God. We come in the name of Jesus, but do we truly worship the person of Jesus? Or are we worshiping what Jesus can give us? I think of as these apostles and as the believers met together and it speaks about them 
gathering in homes and breaking bread one with the other. And there are times that we share a meal together, isn't it? There are times that we will have some food at the back. And, and you know, when I speak about that, we, that we, we, we don't worship the person. In a sense, it, it comes to the way we fellowship one with the other. Because when there's food, we're celebrating the food, not the provider. Why do I say it? It's because I need to fill my plate to overflow. I need to have as much as I can. Why? It's free. It's, it's, it's what, what it, and, and what I'm saying is, and, and this same sense is what we do spiritually. We celebrate what we are receiving rather than the one who is giving. And it's a religious activity. And you know what we don't celebrate? Or what we, we do celebrate? We celebrate what we consider when the Spirit moves. Don't we? we will enjoy the presence and the outpouring of God's Spirit. And we will talk about those things. But when God brings the word that cuts between marrow and bone, there's no celebration. The same provider, the same giver the same spirit. We celebrate one, but we don't celebrate the other. I would rather have God's word cut me deeply that my life changes than just to experience God in a moment. And the problem is we celebrate the superficial rather than the foundational. And it's simply because I believe we've, we've lost our love for God. We've lost this idea of what community is about and what communion is about. If we were to look at, I don't even want you to turn there, I'll read for you. I'm just on a, a note that I, I've missed in my notes, but I, I think it's important. Religion causes us to defend what we believe in. See, when our, our sense of belonging comes from the name of our religion rather than from who we believe in, we're in trouble as a people. You see, I'll defend, I go to the full gospel church, I'll defend the full gospel church rather than the truth that is spoken. I've heard people say that being to places, and Mr. Probably I'm guilty of it as well, and you hear someone speaking something that is just not 100%, and your spirit speaks to you, well, why do we not stand up and say, sorry, hang on, that's not what the Bible says. And I wonder, if it doesn't go back to the sense of who we are first and what we belong to first. You see, if I belong to Jesus first, then I defend the gospel of truth first. And I don't mean defend it radically in the sense that, that um, I now become a hater of people. But I, when I hear things that are not truthful, that I speak out against them. I mean, what, what happens if you hear someone speaking about your brother or sister? Will you defend them or will you defend your own character and remain quiet? You see, I'm trying to poke. I'm poking this morning. How's that? Hmm? I'm prodding. And I don't believe it's me prodding. Why? Because I'm not a person in myself to do that. But I feel that there's prompting from the Holy Spirit in a sense. And that's why I often do it and ask questions of people. Why? Because we need to be understanding who we are. And God used the unity within the early believers 
and their communion with him and one another for powerful manifestations that his name would be glorified throughout their region. And when we read in the, the book of Acts chapter 12, verse 5, it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer, that means believers together. Isn't it? I've said to you often, and I'll continue to say it. Prayer requests go out, or someone says, we need prayer. I'll pray for you, don't worry, when I have time. You see, I want us to understand something here. Because in verse 6, it says, Now when Herod was about to bring him out, that's Peter, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And in verse 12 it says, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, in other words, he's free now, uh, mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And I want you to understand something. Peter's imprisoned for the gospel. God, through an angel, releases him. And why, when it, why it says, and he realized it, just means that Peter thought he was in a dream. Peter thought he was ever having a vision of being released from prison. And when he realized, oh, I'm actually free, he went to the house of those whom he was in fellowship with. But I want you to understand this point, is that fellowship, communion, means sacrifice. When you love someone, it means that you have to give up things for the benefit of that person. And what I'm seeing here is because what it's telling me is that this was nighttime at the time when people would normally be asleep. Hmm? That very night, Peter was sleeping between the two gods. Hmm? Well, I mean, we know Peter to be a person of prayer, don't we? Hmm? And do you think Peter went to jail, put his head down and just slept and said, oh, well, no, no. I'm sure before he went to sleep, he was in prayer for hours before God. And so what I'm trying to express is the sense of here is a community of believers, those who loved Peter, who had taken their time out of sleep that they might pray and be together in communion with God for their fellow brother. You see, God used the early church. Why? Well, they were in unity. And they were in fellowship and they had a relationship and they, and they loved one another. Why? Because they knew one another. And I want us to understand that God wants us, just like the early church, to be a people who commune not only with Him, but one another. <laughs> that are in a relationship that builds far deeper than just on the surface level. That it builds on a relationship just like those believers, that when you're in trouble, I can drop my things and I'm running to help. And I wonder today, if somebody was in trouble in our church, if somebody sent out a distress signal, listen, I'm in this, this situation, how many of us would drop what we are doing to attend to the need of our brother or sister. Because that's what love is, isn't it? That's what relationship is, isn't it? But we need to understand, if we were to go back into that scripture, that both communion and fellowship and relationship take much devotion and prayer. And it takes much supplication and communion with God and communion with you to develop a relationship of love and understanding one for the other. But our lives don't allow for it. In fact, it's not our lives. It's us. It's who we are. It's who we've chosen to be. It's what we've chosen to be doesn't allow for it. And we need to understand that this communion that is required, this relationship that God wants us to have one with the other, was something that was broken by Adam and Eve in the garden. You see, God communed with them. 
but their attitudes and their actions fractured the relationship with God. And the immediate fallout from that is we find Cain kills his brother. And you know that he has no remorse. And so often, in a sense, what Jesus says to us, says through the Bible, he says, you know that you commit murder just by the hate you have in your heart. And so often, we have no remorse for the dislike that we have one for another. That we can actually stand before God like Cain and say, are we our brother's keeper? And that's the problem with our relationships. They're not deeply rooted in the word and the love of Christ. Because we don't understand the love of the cross. We don't fully understand what Paul is writing to us in Ephesians and, and explaining and, say, and, and saying, I want you brothers and sisters to understand this. See, we have this idea that sin breaks communion with God. I don't believe so. I believe the lack of communion is the evidence of sin. I believe the reason we sin and the reason our lives are the way they are is because we lack communion with God. And we lack communion with our brothers and sisters. And you might say, yeah, but hang on, sin stops people coming from God. No, sin stops unbelievers from entering in the presence of God. But your sins have been forgiven. Therefore, what stops you having that relationship with God? It's the communion. It's not the sin. You see, if we spend more time with God, our sin would go away. Why? Because God would be speaking. Why? Because God's word would be divided between matter and God. Why? When God's word speaks, I celebrate. Thank you, Lord. When someone speaks a word of truth, I rejoice. Why? Because he's spoken it over my life and I have more understanding. I can now understand where I'm going wrong. And God, would you come in and help me and strengthen me? And I wrote a little quirk. How's that? Which came first, the egg or the chicken? <laughs> Tell me, which came first, sin or lack of communion? You see, the way I see it, had Adam communed with God about what the enemy had told him, God would have told him, Adam, this is the reason. And Adam would have had an understanding. And he could have made a decision based upon his communion with God. But Adam chose not to commune with God. And what did he do? He decided to listen to the enemy. You see? And our relationships are fractured. Why? Because we don't devote ourselves. You see, because it's no longer as Adam and Eve had it in the garden. You wake up, if you slept, I don't know if they slept, I don't know what they did. But you go and God's there and you talk with God and you walk with God and, and it's all easy. And why? Because God made it that way. You see, we've come through generations where we have been taught things and we have been exposed to things and, and things have been pushed upon us and we've listened to the things of the world rather than listening to the Word and the Spirit of God. And even when we've come into the, into the house of God and we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and we've repented and we've been forgiven of our sin, we still listen to those things. Why? Because our relationship with God is fractured. And Christ came to restore that relationship. Christ came to give us a new love. Christ came to show us that, listen, when Moses, when Moses set up the tent, remember I spoke last week from um, Exodus 33, when Moses went out to the tent. And I want us to understand the sense of it. Moses put the tent of meeting. We're not talking about the tabernacle. It's Moses' tent where he met with God. And Exodus 33 says that anyone who chose to could go there and meet with God. But guess what? It doesn't show any Israelite going to meet. There's only a few that went. The, my, my thought and my understanding of this is that the tent was put outside the camp. Why? Because the sin and the dirt and the filth remained in the camp with the Israelites. And so Moses put the tent outside so that if you wanted to meet with God, you had to go outside of your sinfulness 
and meet with Him. You, you understand? And there comes a time in our lives where we have to go outside of what we are used to, outside of what we are hearing, so that we can meet with God to know what is true and what is not true. That we might have fellowship, that when we've met with God, our relationship improves. You see, that's the purpose of communion with God, is to restore relationships, not only with God, but with each other. And we have to understand that relationships are not easy. Get married, and you'll know what it's like. Hmm? Not that marriage is a bad thing, please. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Just get married. And you will begin to understand. God ordained marriage. But our fractured relationship from the God makes that relationship difficult. Unless, of course, we are communing with God. I want to go back to something I, I mentioned a little bit earlier. The dead end road. You know those roads that you go into and it's got a circle. And you're expecting to go somewhere and you go in and suddenly you realize, ha! And in certain neighborhoods there are many dead end roads, aren't there? And it comes, that road is, is called a cul-de-sac. And so I went to go and have a look to see what that actually means. It comes from a French word, but the Oxford Dictionary says, it's a street or passage closed at one end. A route or course leading nowhere. And when it speaks of the body, the anatomy, it speaks of part of the stomach that is a sac, a tube-like thing. And it comes in origin from a French word which literally means bottom of a sac. See, if we look in Exodus, And we look at the Israelites and the attitude of the Israelites is they sat in camp often grumbling about the things of God. They made idols. In other words, they expected or they thought God's blessings, His mercy and His grace ended with them. In other words, like a cul-de-sac, the bottom of a sack where you put something in and the only way out is if you pull it out from the top. But you see, God's intention was totally different. And he expressed that through the apostles and through the disciples and through the early church. That his grace and his mercy and his love are not something that ends with us. But when we receive those things, those things get passed on through us. You see, we are not the end of the road. We are not the dead end. Although many of us live in the way like the Israelites did, where we, we receive and all we get is receive from God. And we put everything God gives us in the sack. We put it and it just drops to the bottom of the sack. And that's where it remains for life. And we wonder why we don't experience the fullness and the love of God. You see, God didn't want you to have a sack. God wanted you to have a pipe. That what comes in doesn't go out the same, but it goes out with more vibrance and more love and, and more goodness. Not that you can add to God, but that God's Spirit in you sends out the goodness of the living God. And so I, I receive a word from God and God speaks to me. And so sometimes when I, when I bring a message, it's one single thought that ends up in pages and pages and pages as the Spirit begins to speak. And so often for me, is I just get a thought. It might be somebody said something. It might be I might have read a scripture. And, and it's not a thought in the sense as, a, as outside of scripture. It's a thought that comes through scripture. And what I'm trying to express to you is, is the fact that as, as this message comes in as a, a small thought, 
it goes out. And for some of you, it's a long, boring one. And for others, it might be an inspiring one. And hopefully, for us, it will be one that brings change into our lives. And that's the idea of God's grace and mercy and God's communion with each one of us. Is that when he speaks to us, and he doesn't just speak to us because we walk in a room and say, Lord, speak to me. He speaks to us because we devote ourselves to prayer, because we devote ourselves to reading the scriptures, because we devote ourselves to spending time one with the other. See, there are times when I need you because I'm at the bottom and I need you to uplift. And there are times that you are down at the bottom, but you know what the normal thing is for us to do? The normal thing is for me to hide in my little dungeon until I feel better or God does something differently. And we expect God to do things differently for us than what he did through the early church. Why? I don't know, maybe we think we're more special. Maybe we think we hard a case. I sometimes think, Lord, I must be the hardest case, the worst scenario that you've ever had in your life to deal with. Because I can be stubborn. But, but you understand this idea. When we don't have something we need to meet, a deadline, whatever it is, we allow God's intention, God's purpose, God's plan to pass us by. Next week, Lord, tomorrow, tonight, we, we never ever say, Lord, let's do this now. Lord, I'm going to put away my schedule for the day. I'm going to put away my husband and my kids or my wife and my kids or, or my dad and my mom or, or whatever it might be. And I'm going to find a space that you can talk and commune with me. Why? Because, Lord, I know it's important. Because, Lord, I know of everything in this world, not my bank account, not the car, not the house I live in, but you, Lord, are the most important person in my life. See? And that's the heart that we should have. That's what the cross is telling us that God wants with us. He's saying, listen, I'll nail my son to the cross. I'll shed his blood for you. Why? Because I love you. Why? Because you're important to me. Why? Because it, it, it's what I purposed for you. You see, and God is just saying, if you will just come, if you will just come, I've already restored the relationship. All I want you to do is to come back to me. Listen to what I have to say to you. And when we begin to listen to what God has to say, when we, when we go out to that tent of meeting, when we go out to the place that God has appointed, when we find the space, the closet, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. Find the space. Because the tragedy is, and the shame that we have, is that like the Israelites, very few of us seek communion with God. True communion. See, we seek other people's fellowship above the fellowship of God. And in fact, we seek worldly fellowship beyond the fellowship of believers. I want to encourage you this morning that we begin to prioritize the health of our soul above the needs of our bodies, above the desires of our minds, and that we begin to seek the Lord in, in truth and in spirit. And that we begin to find God for who he is and celebrate the person rather than the benefits. That life would become a priority spiritually, mentally, in restoration. Let us begin to commune with God. Let us begin to commune with each other. Because often I think, you know, 
we're more interested in about the numbers of people who are in church with us than we're interested in the person who sits next to us. And I'm not talking about, talking about the person you came to church with. I'm talking about the person that you haven't spoken to. The one that you haven't fellowshiped with. The one that you haven't prayed with. The one that you haven't prayed over. You see, we are guilty, as the world is guilty, of having cliques even within the body. Mm, I've got those people I like, and there's those that I don't like. I'll pray with you, but not you. I'll have you pray for me, but not them. And I don't say, let's just allow anybody to lay hands on us, because I do say this, that we must always be careful about who we allow to lay hands on us. Because when you say to a person, you have the authority to pray over me and touch me and lay hands on me, whatever's inside of you has authority over me. And that's why when we commune, these believers who gathered together in the homes, they knew each other. Anyone could pray for anyone. Why? Because they knew everyone. They knew the hearts of everybody. Why? Because they devoted many hours together to seeking the face of God. And if we are the believers in Christ, say a baker bakes, how can a baker ever know how well or great the food tastes unless other people taste? It might be sufficient for your palate, but others need to taste it. Because then you can be called a baker, isn't it? You know? And we as Christians, how do we know we're in communion and in right relationship with God? It's when others taste what we have to present. It's what we have to give brings life, brings encouragement, brings truth brings change. And it's only when we are in true communion with God that we can truly say that we are truly His. Father, we thank You for Your Word and Your goodness, Lord. We pray, Father, that You would enlighten us and strengthen us, Lord. It's not more wisdom that we need, Lord, but more understanding, more application, Lord. More doing, more devotion, Lord, to your word and to each other, Father. I ask the strength for each and every one who has heard this message, that we might apply these things that we've heard, and maybe the most, not the most eloquent, Lord, but I do believe, Lord, as we listen, you impress upon us through your spirit, Lord, what is right for us and what we need, Lord. And I pray that we will act upon that, not in our strength but in yours, Lord. And we just thank you, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.